Hello, my name is Dr. Ruth Williams, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Glaucoma Research Foundation's second annual Glaucoma Patient Summit. We would like to thank Allergan, our presenting sponsor, for their leadership support of this event, as well as all of our corporate sponsors who helped make today's summit possible. Our next session will be presented by Dr. Inder Paul Singh, who will review current and new glaucoma treatment options. Dr. Singh is the president of the Eye Centers of Racine and Kenosha in Wisconsin. He received his undergraduate degree from Washington University in St. Louis and his medical degree from Finch University of Health Sciences, Chicago Medical School. He completed his glaucoma fellowship at Duke University before returning back to his hometown where he is currently in private practice. Dr. Singh has a strong passion for innovation and new technology. He was the first in Wisconsin to perform many minimally invasive procedures and is also involved with clinical research for glaucoma. Please welcome Dr. Inder Paul Singh. Hey everybody, my name is Dr. Paul Singh from the Eye Centers of Racine and Kenosha out here in Southeast Wisconsin. I want to say thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of this webinar and wanted to applaud the Glaucoma Research Foundation for all their tireless efforts uh, to help us hopefully find a cure someday, but at least in the meantime, promote research and education as well as new treatment options for, until we find that cure. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about what we have now today, but also what we have hopefully coming down in the near future to help both our patients as well as us as providers as well. Uh, again, I am from Wisconsin, so I'm a true Packer fan, Cheesehead. <laughs> so hope, uh, we have some Packer fans out there as well listening. Uh, that's my, my Cheesehead that my parents uh, gave me when I was a young kid to make sure I never forgot who my, my roots were <laughs> and what they were. Uh, this is a little bit about Wisconsin. For those of you who haven't been out to Wisconsin, we love our Packer fans. We love our, our, our quarterbacks. Cheese, beer, uh, and if you're in the winter, please wear a coat. <laughs> it gets pretty chilly out here. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you about how we currently treat glaucoma and and. Unfortunately, all we have right now, one of the modifiable risk factors that we have is bringing the pressures down. So bringing eye pressures down is all we have. And I'm sure a lot of you already, already have seen a lot of these videos on how we maintain our pressure, but the eye has fluid that's being made in the area behind the iris, behind the collar part of the eye, called the ciliary body. And that fluid, the aqueous, we call it, comes to the front of the eye, which is the anterior chamber, and it drains through a meshwork, a bunch of pores called the trabecular meshwork. And that meshwork then fluid then drains to a canal behind it into what we call the distal channels or these little small pores into the bloodstream. Now what's happening in glaucoma is that we of course have a blockage either in that meshwork, those pores, the canal behind it, or be behind that in those distal channels. So the pressure builds up in the eye because the fluid can't leave the eye like a water balloon getting tighter. So the idea is to bring those pressures down. So how do we bring pressures down? Well, we have medications, medications which we'll talk about in drop form. We also have beam of light treatment or a laser called SLT and other lasers we'll talk about as well. We also have what we call minimally or micro-invasive glaucoma surgeries, which has really changed the paradigm uh, for glaucoma treatment as well. And also so what we call standardized, or I like to call standardized subconjunctival bypass procedures, way, ways to kind of bypass the inner drain your system and divert fluid out of the eye into the outside of the eye through a different mechanism. And there's more safer procedures that we have. And then we have traditional glaucoma surgeries. All these, these are also bypass surgeries, but they're more traditional. And then we have something kind of neat coming down the road, which is basically using pressurized goggles to help uh, get rid of pressure or decrease pressure and help blood flow through a different mechanism. So we'll talk about what we have today, but also what we are coming down as well. A little review of glaucoma medications. We have a lot. <laughs> and the reason why is because there's no perfect drop and some people prefer or respond better to some classes of medications than others. So we'll go through some of these different classes and, and really a brief overview of what they do and also some of the risks and benefits of each one of them. So looking at the eye, as we talked about the eye is a water balloon. The eye makes fluid, which is right down here in this part of the eye, goes in the front of the eye into a, the, what we call the trabecular meshwork into the canal, into the bloodstream. So we have a bunch of these classes of medication called, called aqueous humor inflow or aqueous production, uh, decreased in aqueous production rather. And these aqueous suppressants, we call them, help decrease how much fluid the eye makes. By decreasing how much fluid the eye makes, pressure can go down. So we have beta blockers, which we'll, call, we'll talk about, something called alpha agonists and carbonic anhydrous inhibitors, CAIs. We also have uh, medications that help open the pores out here called the ciliary body or the uh, secondary outflow mechanism. 
We have a primary mechanism of outflow where the fluid leaves the eye. We talked about this meshwork. We have a secondary mechanism here through the ciliary body, which these drugs called prostaglandin analogs can actually open up those pores and help the fluid leave the eye better that way. We've also had for years a medication called pilocarpine, which is a medication that brings the pupil down, kind of stretches open the meshwork that those uh, cells we talked about, the pores, to help the fluid leave the eye better. And so we'll talk about some of these traditional glaucoma drops we've had. Betamol and Timolol, these other drops that we have are yellow top drops. These are drops that work very well by decreasing how much fluid the eye makes. We've had these drops for decades now, and they've kind of been a mainstay of treatment for many, many years. They, they work well. They're usually now once a day medications, but they do have some systemic risks. If you have asthma, breathing problems, uh, diabetes sometimes can be, can be made worse, depression can be made worse as well. And so there's a number of systemic or heart rhythm issues where you have to be careful using a beta blocker. And also over time, something called tachyphylaxis, where the drugs stop working as well, unfortunately. So over time, the effect of the medication, bringing the pressures down, sometimes doesn't work as well. There's also, though, in the bottom here, these little, little packets, a preservative-free option. We'll talk a lot about preservative-free because patients do have a hard time taking medications, but also the preservatives over time can irritate the eye. And sometimes using a preservative-free version can help decrease the chances of it causing more irritation or ocular surface disease slash dry eye as well. But this is called Timolol or Betamol, which is a, a very commonly used medication. Another kind of adjunct medication we use kind of second line a lot of times is something called carbonic anhydrous inhibitors. Now, there's a brand name medication called Azopt, also a generic form of it called dorzolamide. And, and these are medications that work well. They're usually twice a day medications. And they work, again, by decreasing how much fluid the eye makes, aqueous suppressants. And these are very safe medications. They do have sometimes a bitter taste, a little bit of a kind of a metallic -y taste. They can blur. The Azopt has a suspension, so kind of a thicker drop that it causes sometimes a little blurring temporarily as well. And because they have preservatives in them, they can also cause a lot of surface issues over time as well. Uh, very rare if you have a systemic uh, sulfa allergy. You may hear about, oh, if you have a sulfa allergy, don't use these medications. Uh, in a pill form, that can be uh, an issue, something called diamox acetazolamide. But in these topical forms, we have not seen a significant allergic reaction, even if you have a sulfa allergy uh, in, in for systemic or pill medications. Another class of medications is something called bromonidine, uh, which is in a generic form, bromonidine 0.2%, or alphagan P, which is 0.1%. Uh, the company Allergan has actually decreased the concentration by changing some of the vehicles and the pH and preservative to allow us to decrease the concentration, but yet have the same efficacy as the 0.2 generic. That's important because these medications, although are potent and do very well, they can actually unfortunately cause a delayed what we call hypersensitivity, uh, allergic reactions, even months or years after uh, tolerating the medication initially. They also can cross the blue blood-brain barrier, we call it. So in young kids, we tend not to use these medications. And uh, they can also cause dry mouth, sometimes a little bit of some weakening or dizziness as well. So powerful medications do very well. And for most people, they respond great and are safe. But you have to be aware of some of those what we call adverse events that can happen. Probably the most commonly used medication we have now uh, is something that we've used all the time. It's kind of our first line or our, really our foundational therapy is something called a prostaglandin analog, these kind of green, teal green top ones. And they're important. The initial one that came out many, many years ago was called Zalatan, a brand name, now generic form is Latanoprost. Again, a very powerful medication, brings our pressures down about 30% reduction, which is really important. What we want when we treat someone with a glaucoma, we want that initial reduction from their baseline pressure. About 30% is what we hopefully get. And we do that, get that with these medications. So once a day, very well tolerated. Probably the biggest issue we face is just most likely um, red eyes sometimes. What we call hyperemia, but they're very well tolerated once a day. They actually open up the drainage system in the ciliary body, those pores I was telling you about. That's a secondary outflow mechanism. And there's different kinds out there. Lumigan called Bimatoprost is Travitan, Travaprost, and something called Zyoptan, which is a company that has a preservative-free version as well. So very powerful medications work great and usually have become now our first-line agents. It really changed the landscape of, of pharmaceuticals because they've allowed us now to really better control pressures and maintain higher satisfied patients. But because it is hard to take medications, and if we look at different data sets, sometimes it can take 30 or 40, sometimes 50% of our patients to be on more than one medication to get them down low enough pressures to the pressure that we think is going to help stabilize their eye, prevent them from further progression of glaucoma. And so to get sometimes low enough, it's not just one medication, but sometimes two. 
And studies do show the more you add a second or third medication, the harder and harder it is to keep those pressures down and keep people from not forgetting <laughs> to take medications. So now we have combination therapy that's really become a mainstay too for our, our, a lot of our patients. So it's Comigan, which is a combination of bromonidine and Timolol or Cosopt, which is that CAI, the orange top drop, as well as the yellow top drop. Or people who cannot tolerate, let's say, the yellow top drop, the beta blocker, there's something called Simbrinza, which is bromonidine and brinzolamide, the orange cap and the, 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 the uh, purple cap. So again, different combinations of those medications I talked about earlier that can help us get the pressures down. So many patients can be on, let's say, that prostaglandin analog and one of these combination medications. And our pressures can actually stay pretty darn low now, avoiding surgery for a lot of people. So I think these combination drops have really helped us a great deal. What has been exciting and something that I've been excited about lately has been the utilization of new molecules, new mechanisms of action. One is called latanoprosine bunot or vesolta. The other one's called natarsidil or opressa, which comes also in a combination, the zalatan or latanoprost and Ropressa or Natarsidil is something called Roclitan. So they were excited about these different medications because they also utilize different mechanisms of action. We talked earlier about the slide showing us that we have medications that decrease the production of aqueous fluid. We also have the ones that help it flow through this area here called the ciliary body. Well, now these medications actually have the ability to have, allow us to access flow or to improve flow through the trabecular meshwork, which is where we think most of our pathology is. Most of the people who have glaucoma, we think there's a blockage or increased resistance in those pores where the fluid leaves the eye through that meshwork as well. So these medications, latanoprosin bunot or visolta or rock inhibitors, natarsidil, trade name is called Ropressa, we think work on that mechanism, which is the disease pathology or where we see the resistance initially. And so that's really what it's exciting about uh, what we have today is that now being able to address the area where we think is the pathology is, is exciting. Plus these are very powerful molecules, which we'll talk about as well. So again, helping us address the trabecular meshwork here not just out here or decreasing flow. And that becomes important because if we can start to address the actual pathology where, it's, where there's some increase in resistance early on, can we help prevent it from further collapsing further down the road? That's the exciting potential that we think might be happening. Here's just a nice little, little diagram showing us here, a video rather, that you want to have these nitric oxide molecules naturally occurring. And it occurs in our, in our body and in the heart, etc. And these molecules, we think, help keep the fluid, the meshwork, the beams separated. On the left in a glaucoma, you see how they're more packed together here. And this packed together decreases how much fluid can flow out of the eye. And so what nitric oxide that Natarsidil, or rather the latanoprosin buna does, is it helps when it gets absorbed in the eye, it gets broken down one molecule into latanoprost, which is zalatan we talked about, as well as nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is very short-lived, it's a gas, but it helps open those little pores up between the meshwork cells to allow fluid to flow. It blocks both rho kinase and it activates something called calcium, which it channels, which help, again, relax the, the smooth muscle walls, the linings, and opens up those pores. And now this is a lot more detail than a lot of people want to get into, but the exciting p reason why I love this is because it does affect the area where we see resistance in our patients who have glaucoma. So it's an exciting time to allow us to actually address the area, again, of pathology. And, and to show how well it works is, you know, when you compare this to what we call Zalatan, Latanopros, which is a prostaglandin analog that we talked about earlier, it does show about a millimeter and a half or so better efficacy or better reduction of pressure on average than uh, people who are on Latanopros. So if you look at some of the data sets out there early on, uh, about 69% of patients achieved a pressure of 18 or less uh, for the, versus people on Zalatan, about 50%. So again, we're getting a better chance of getting down to those lower pressures as well. Getting even further details now, we have better chance of getting down even lower. And some, some people achieved four or five millimeter uh, or five points better pressure reduction than Zalatan. So again, it might be a nice uh, adjunct or something else to use as a first line even in some patients. The other new drug we talked about is something called Natarsidil also known as Ropressa, uh, in combination with Zalatan called Roclatan. And what this does also, again, by, re by inhibiting ROC, which are basically molecules that allow uh, actin and myosin, these two little uh, compounds, uh, molecules that clump together to thicken the beams, it helps uh, prevent that from happening. And you see on the left here how, kind of how compact that purple tissue is. This is the trabecular meshwork, those beams. And here, after putting uh, pe people on a rock, or this is a histology slide, you see how much more open those pores are. So we're actually, again, opening up 
the meshwork pores to allow fluid to flow out of the eye better again. And again, which is really kind of neat to show is that when you use this drug, Natarsidil or Opressa, when you add it to other medications, you still get a significant response, about four millimeters or five millimeters of mercury reduction as well. This is a study called a MO study, a, a practical real life, real, real world study that was published that showed us that when you add it to other medications like a prostaglandin or others, you still get a better chance of getting down to lower pressures. Just showing you here in patients who were on other drops already, when you added the uh, natarsidil or repressa, you had a better chance of getting down to 14, 15, 16 in the blue than you did with the other ones as well. And this is just showing you again, when you look at patients who were added repressa to a prostaglandin analog, the Zaltan world, right? You see how it brought down the pressure about four points or so. But even if you had patients who are on on more than just the latanoprost or bimatoprost, if we're on multiple drops, you still got four points. And that's exciting. And we think part of that reason might be is because it also decreases the, something called the episcleral venous pressure, which is the pressure in the venous system where the fluid drains into, right? If you have the pressure in the blood vessels higher, it's hard for fluid to go into the blood vessels. Well, if you can decrease that, uh, that pressure in the blood vessels, easier for fluid from the, on the eye to flow into the bloodstream, that can bring the pressure down. So we think that could be part of another reason why we see regardless of how many medications and whatever pressure you started with, you still get that four to five millimeter mercury reduction. So exciting time for us to have these options as well. There's again, another uh, a slide here showing when you combine natarsidil with Zalatan or Latanoprost, something called Rocklatan, which we have now, just showing us compared to Latanoprost alone, we see greater patients achieving 14 or 15 or even 16. So we're able to get down to lower pressures, and Rocklatan is just one drop at night. So again, improving the ability of patients to not have to forget multiple drops a day, also being able to bring, being powerful enough to get down to those lower pressures, I think is really helping a lot of our patients. Uh, the main issue with all these drops though, as I mentioned earlier, is sometimes you do have adverse events or side effects of drops. You know, with Natarsidil or Rocklatan, red eye on the left down below here, something we see all the time. It doesn't hurt the eye. We always tell patients, even if your eye's red, don't worry, it's not gonna hurt you permanently, but it can happen, especially because with those medications, we think it's helping blood flow. But even drops like Prostaglandin analogs, the typical latanoprost and others, they can cause red eyes, but they can also cause issues with the thickening of the lashes here. You can see on the left here, this has patient had uh, one eye having latanoprost, the other eye didn't. You see a little uh, kind of also how the little loss of fat pads around the, around the eyes as well. So we can see that. We also can see allergic reactions. We talked about bromonidine causing allergic reactions. So no doubt drops do have side effects. So as much as we love them, it can be hard to take medications. And this is where I think for me as a provider is probably one of the hardest issues we face in, in medical management of glaucoma. How do we keep people on drops forever? It's tough, especially if you go forget medications, the cost of medications, the side effects of medications. There's a number of reasons why it's difficult for our patients, even people out there who are having a hard time taking them every day. And we understand that. It's tough for us as, as surgeons, as providers as well. And we also know that drops uh, are difficult sometimes to keep people on them, but also for them to get in the eye. About only 5% of the dose actually uh, of a medication gets into the eye because of the, it gets washed out of the eye, drains into our tear duct, and some of it also does just get, doesn't get through the eye itself. And so for it's a lot difficult, a lot more difficult to get drops in the eye in general, which is why companies work on different vehicles or solutions. And this is why also I'm a big fan of making sure patients, if they can, uh, understand the difference between a brand name and generic. We do have generic medications out there. I think it's fantastic. But I do think it's important for patients to realize not all the generics have the same uh, um, inactive ingredients or outsource rather those in inactive ingredients from the same source. So there's potential some variability in, in, in efficacy depending on which generic manufacturer you have. So that's why patients, it's really important to understand if your pressure may be going up and down, it could be a generic versus a brand name uh, issue as well because a solution, the pH, the preservative, what we call the buffering point, can actually impact how well that drop gets absorbed in the eyes. So something just to be aware of as well. And these are just some, some fun little, little videos I, I kind of found <laughs> that show us that it's not easy. And, and people will find w different ways to get those drops in the eye. And so we're not, we're not, uh, we, we, don't, we, we don't want you to think we don't understand how difficult it is for you, for you all to take medications. But also even adding drops with preservatives. We talked about preservative-free drops. The more drops you add, the more it can cause sometimes dry eye because it's preservative, something called benzoclonium chloride, a typical preservative in those bottles. And the more drops, the more chemicals we put in the eye, if you look here, three bottles or more over time in different studies show us that we have a higher rate of what we call dry eye. Dry eye can cause 
tearing, burning, fluctuating vision, pain, redness, all those different symptoms may not be the glaucoma itself. It actually more likely is the surface dryness from either having a dry eye already or these glaucoma drops making it worse as well. Just another showing, a study showing us that dry eye disease was a predictor of people being non-compliant, not able to take their medications long term. And if you had dry eye, you had less compliance versus if someone had no dry eye as well. So it's important to realize that, that the more drops we add, which is why those combination of medications or getting preservative-free medications can be a, a benefit as well. And why, do I, why am I concerned about fluctuating or patients not compliance if you forget a drop every day here and there? Well, it could lead to higher chances of getting worse. So if you have more advanced glaucoma, studies show us, you've seen this little light pink line here, that if you fluctuated throughout the day in a study here called the Advanced Glaucoma Interventional Study, the more chance you had of it of progressing versus if you had more stable pressures uh, as well throughout the study. So again, this is why for me, especially the more advanced we get, the more we really want to try to minimize the amount of times patients' pressures go up and down. And that could be partly due to compliance as well. So because of all those compliance issues, even though drops are wonderful and I think we need them, uh, we do realize that it's hard for, for everybody to take medications for the rest of their life. Now we have drug delivery. We have a approval now of a product called Darista, which I'll talk to you about here on the left. There are other companies making new products in investigational form right now. There are products we'll talk about that are little implants that actually have a canister that releases medication over sometimes a year plus. We have other external devices that we can look at that we're looking at now to also release medicine. So drug delivery is a very hot topic and it tries to address some of those issues we talked about with compliance. So we talked a little bit about this idea of, of an implant that takes just a few seconds to place gently in the eye at the slit lamp. So at those, at those examination lamps that you go into to check your pressures, we can just press a button and it gently goes into the eye, which allows us to release this medicine, that Lumigan drop or bimatoprost I mentioned earlier, that prostaglandin analog, one drop of that Lumigan, so it's 10 micrograms, one drop actually is in this little pellet that's, a, that's the size of the eye on the Liberty dime that goes into the eye and releases medicine over four months. But the effect of that medicine can last literally up to two years. And some of this in the state studies, the phase two trials, we found that if one implant, 25% of people had pressures that were still down without rescue therapy for two years. So only four months of actual release of medication, but yet up to two years and it's about 25% of people. And that, the reason why is by being inside the eye, releasing medicine over a 24-hour period, does it have a potential to change the disease state? to modify the natural progression of those pores closing up as well. So of course, we'll have to wait and see as time goes on, but at least what's what exciting about it now is that it also decreases the compliance issues that we face. So here's a little diagram, a little nice schematic uh, video showing us what happens. We actually just gently take a microscopic a needle there, go into the eye just a few seconds, press a button, come right out. Doesn't hurt, just topical drops and numb it up. Right here at the lamp, that medicine releases, uh, the medicine's being released rather for four months and uh, nothing else to do, which is very nice. So it replaces, hopefully, that prostaglandin analog for whether it's four months or even six months, a year, or two years, like we talked about as well. So exciting technology. I've done a lot of these in my office. Patients are very happy and satisfied. And so those people who have an issue with tolerability, forgetfulness, or on multiple drops, this is a great option to help, at least for a time being, uh, to allow us. And this is what it looks like to me with a special little um, lens that we use on the eye, sitting down inside the eye there, patient was uh, having a hard time taking medications. Now the pressure's started in the upper 20s, now in the 16 range off of medications. Patient's very happy with it. So an option I think that we can hopefully uh, utilize more and more. Uh, here's something that's called the IDOS, which is something I've been, been part of the studies. It's not approved yet, uh, but it's another way of delivering medication. It's a small little in, uh, implant that stays in, in the eye, has a little canister that releases medicine over a year plus. And so we're looking at those studies right now. This is releasing something called Travaprost, or the trade name is Travitan, but this company called Glaucos is, is working on that. And so I think we're, we're going to see more and more uh, data on these drug delivery platforms. And hopefully in the next year, two, three years, we'll see more and more options for us, uh, for our patients, to hopefully decrease the need to take topical drops because of all those issues we face. Also, what's exciting, and there's a new study that came out recently last year called the LIGHT study, looking at laser trabeculoplasty, or SLT, something called MLT as well. But SLT, selective laser trabeculoplasty, is a beam of light, basically, that stimulates 
our tissue in the eye, the trabecular meshwork tissue here with the laser. And what it does, it doesn't cut or destroy. It just stimulates. It's non-destructive and it allows us to cause a natural reaction in your eye to open up those pores of the trabecular meshwork, right? To help let the fluid flow of the eye better as well. So that's the basic idea. And this is just a real life, one of my videos here, uh, there's a little red as an aiming beam. You see little gas bubbles are forming. That's just me, that, that uh, brown line is the trabecular meshwork with one of my lenses. And I'm just basically using this laser to stimulate those, that meshwork to release your own enzymes to help the pressures come down as well. So it's a, a fantastic procedure. It takes about a minute to do in the office. And again, the idea is to help release your what we call natural reaction. There's something called ALT on the left you see here, ALT versus SLT. ALT was a previous laser that used something called the argon laser, which did cause some scarring. So you couldn't use it more than once after that you had to stop. But with SLT, because it doesn't cause any destruction or any kind of cauterization, the good thing is you can repeat it again. So if it works well, let's say in a year or two years, it goes back up again, you can repeat this SLT again as well. And there have been a number of studies showing us that it does repeat. And again, we're releasing these enzymes and the cytokines, we call them, to help open up the pores naturally. So it's kind of rejuvenating the natural drainage system as well. Now, it does have some risk as well, although it's very, very low risk. The pressure can transiently go up. So that's why we check your pressure about a half an hour after the procedure is done. It can cause some temporary inflammation. So if someone has inflammation going into it, we want to hold off until someone has no inflammation. Sometimes it doesn't work for everybody. About 80% of the time it works. 20% of the time it may not work as well, but it's, again, very safe and quick. And Again, because of the inflammation, irritation, the vision can be blurry, and, and sometimes it causes a brow ache as well, and a little bit of transient eye discomfort. But again, I've had a uh, very, very few issues with this, a very safe procedure we do, again, all the time as well. And the, I was mentioning the study called the LIGHT study. This is a study that was done that looked at comparing topical prostaglandins, latanoprost, versus this laser. And what they found over a few years was that actually it kind of saves the healthcare system cost, but you had both drops and laser did a good job of bringing the pressures down but you had less issues with fluctuation eye pressures in the, in the um, laser group. And none, more importantly, none of the people in the laser group in, progressed towards needing what we call incisional or traditional glaucoma surgery, which is kind of a surrogate for had less chance of progression. And why could that be? Well, maybe because of compliance. So even though the pressures are the same, between drops and SLT, the laser, having not have to worry about taking drops every day might have a theoretical potential of better pressure control and less chance of progression. So this is why I think first line SLT now is an option for a lot of our patients. And we offer it, doesn't mean everybody takes it, but it's a nice option and it is covered by insurance as well. So this is kind of my little spiel, that's just me <laughs> Again, uh, just th thinking that I, for me, it's, it's really an option. I think there's very, very few reasons why this is not an option first line. But again, not everybody wants to do a beam of light. And some people do like to have, have drops first, but it's definitely an option. I think the earlier we adopt laser trabeculoplasty, when you have healthier tissues, the, I think the better chance we have of it working in, in from my, my experience. But with those beam of light treatments and drug delivery, and I think we're seeing also this new shift to redefining what is controlled glaucoma. Because if someone comes in and says, I can't afford my medications, I can't take them, my eyes are always red, there's no, there's no way the patient's gonna be compliant the rest of their life. It's hard. And the higher chance of, of what we call visual field progression or fluctuating pressures as well. And so I think there's a new interventional mindset, this mindset that we have to now intervene a little earlier to help you as a patient to not to deal with all the risks of the stresses of taking medications. Now on the right, you see these, these are tubes and these, these are surgeries that we do, what we call trabeculectomy, making a flap like a trap door to allow the fluid to leave the eye and flip the flap back. Wonderful surgeries, they do work well, but they have a little more risks with them and there's surgical options. So we've kind of always used to hold off on surgery until people were more advanced where they had to have surgery. But now with this new type of surgery I'm gonna to talk to you about, we allow ourselves to intervene much earlier. And so instead of waiting for those more incisional surgeries, we have something called MIGS or micro or minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. This is something that's really changed the paradigm in glaucoma for me and many other my colleagues as well, just because now we're able to intervene much earlier in the disease state to again, to get people off of medications and or get the pressures even lower, even if they have to be on medication. So surgeries that are the hallmark, which is safety and less trauma to the target tissues. This is me in the operating room one day where I had a bunch of different glaucoma MIGS procedures at one day. And I said, wow, it's just so nice because now because each one of these procedures has their pluses and minuses, we can really tailor our treatments to the patient. And I think that's what's exciting about MIGS today as well. 
And so what, what I, I'm excited about is because of the high safety, the relative efficiency and straightforward application of some of these procedures, I think general ophthalmologists, non-glaucoma specialists feel much more comfortable, along with drug delivery, to intervene much earlier as well. I think we're now we're being more aware of people's non-compliance or lack of compliance, and we're getting, I think we're addressing this much earlier in the disease state. Now, with these different MIGS procedures, as we talked about with drops working, have different mechanisms of action, how they work, whether they decrease flow or they help it flow out better. Now we're talking about how do we have these devices help us allow the fluid to leave the eye better? Well, they can work through the trabecular meshwork like we talked about, through another mechanism through the, this area here called the, just the uveoscleral pathway or superciliary, we call it, as well. There's also the option of bypassing, like we talked about with those traditional surgeries, but do a minimally invasive or a safer approach of that bypass. Or we have now lasers also that can help us decrease how much fluid the, the eye makes with a laser in the eye versus a laser on the outside in the eye that can help decrease fluid from this area called the ciliary body band. So we'll talk to you about the, these, what we call conventional outflow pathway. These are devices and procedures that work by opening up the natural drain, the trabecular meshwork, the canal, or those distal channels we talked about. There's stents that do that, that kind of stent through the, uh, the blockage. There are different devices that actually open up the drain, kind of like an angioplasty for the heart. We can open up the drain internally and balloon it up. And we have the, on the right there, we have medis or devices that can remove that strip of trabecular meshwork completely or gently cut it to help us, again, let the fluid flow out of the eye better. So let's talk to, talk to you really briefly about these stents. Uh, the stents in 2012, Glaucos came out with the eye stent, the original one. Now in 2018, the eye stent uh, is inject is what it's called in this year, something called the W, which is a little different version of the eye stent inject. The bottom line, this and the Hydrus micro stents are two stents that are, I use a lot that are utilized during the time of cataract surgery. So you're already in the eye, you already have the cataract, now we can put a stent through that trabecular meshwork, that blockage that we talked about earlier, into the canal that will allow us to actually help the fluid flow out of the eye better. The hallmark of these devices are, are extremely high safety. There's no difference between cataract surgery alone or cataract with those stents. But the key in the United States is you have to have a cataract to do, the, to do those. Glaucose is working on actually three stents now and do it as what we call a standalone. It's not approved yet for that purpose, but in the future, we should have the ability to actually allow us to do three stents and have uh, hopefully a patient who, let's say, doesn't have a cataract, and we can do it on those patients. The Hydrus uh, is a, a, another stent, like I mentioned earlier, which uh, not only goes through that little meshwork, but it actually scaffolds and kind of opens up the canal behind the meshwork. What's nice about this study, three years data, showed us that compared to cataract surgery alone, the hydrus and the cataract combination had less chance of people needing drops, but also had less chance of needing incisional surgery. So people who had the, it's the hydrus had less chance of going to incisional surgery. On the right here is just some re recap of the light study that I was showing another per, uh, from another presentation there. But on the left here is this hydrus data showing with the stent and cataract, without the stent and just the cataract alone, more percentage of people progress towards needing incisional glaucoma surgery. So again, the idea is to help earlier intervene, get people off of medications, hopefully less chance of progression. What's, what we did have approval for a few years ago was a stent that worked in the space called the supraciliary space. This is a space that is behind the natural drainage system that is a very powerful space. I mean, it, you can get pressures much lower. It's all, all still in the eye, which is very nice. The problem with that stent, there were some issues with some irritation to the surface of the eye called the cornea. But now we have two devices that are under investigation and hopefully soon we'll have approval, something called a miniject. Uh, which is uh, from a company in Europe. And Glaucose, the same company that makes the eye stent, has something called a Supra, which again, fits through an area. This is all ab internal, meaning inside the eye, nothing on the outside of the eye. It allows us to, for the fluid to drain through a different mechanism but behind where the natural drain goes. This goes into behind the retina, behind the eye. And so I think this is something that we're excited about because it has the potential to really bring the pressures down very low, but also it, can, it doesn't have to rely on the natural drainage system. So wherever the blockage is in the natural drain, this doesn't go through that. This goes through a different mechanism to allow us to help us get the pressure down even lower. Another uh, potential technology that uh, has some promise, which is something that's not available yet in America, but in Europe as, as well, it is. Uh, it's called the ELT, or eczema laser trabeculostomy. This is a small micro fiber optic um, 
tool that uses a laser to make an opening into the meshwork, into the, into the sclera, which is behind the meshwork, to allow these micro pores to allow fluid to flow out of the eye. And because it doesn't leave behind, behind any scarring, they don't close up, they maintain their patency. It's a very elegant, very quick procedure that also allows us to open up those drainage systems so that the fluid leave the eye better. And so the idea of this is very minimal trauma, doesn't scar down, efficiency and very high safety with these. Again, all these MIGS procedures have a high safety profile and very efficient as well. Unfortunately, like we talked about earlier, although we want to use our natural drain or stay inside the eye, sometimes we have to bypass the internal drainage system of the eyes and use what we call an external bypass or a subconjunctival surgery, which is what we call Zen or now something coming out in the next year, hopefully, something called pressure flow. Now, these procedures, kind of like, again, a heart, you can either do an angioplasty to reopen the drainage of the uh, natural blood vessels, or you can do a bypass. And what we're doing here is saying, let's bypass the internal drainage system completely and put a stent or a tube, rather, that goes from inside of the eye to outside of the eye, but in a very safe, controlled fashion. And you see a small little line right here. That's a stent that goes from inside of the eye to outside of the eye. Same thing here. This is the pressure flow down below. And there's just a nice, nice picture of a Zen, one of my patients here, where you have this nice little line there. You can see how it's flowing from inside the eye to, and it exits out here underneath the tissue called the conjunctiva. That's a thin cellophane membrane that covers the white part of the eye. We can actually put this stent that goes underneath that tissue. You see here, this is the conjunctiva, this is the white part of your eye, and this is that little stent that goes in between those layers. Again, it's a beautiful surgery, takes a very, very efficient, efficient uh, amount of time a very straightforward, comfortable uh, post-operative course. Uh, and this is uh, something that we've adopted a great deal in our practice for those patients who need a subconjunctival bypass. Because it has a very small opening, only 45 microns, 0.45 millimeters, it has a nice controlled amount of flow, less chance of pr pressures being too low. In fact, if you look at the data and their trials, they had zero chance of having what we call hypotony, too low pressures, or causing uh, any significant adverse events, we call it as well. So the, hit, the safety of this procedure is so high that it's allow us to perform these what we call bypass surgeries much earlier where we would say wait and wait and wait and wait because the traditional version of this called trabeculectomy didn't have the same safety profile. And so a lot of us would wait until someone really had significant damage and then we would do the surgery. And you're always kind of chasing the tail there. This is allows us to do it much earlier in the disease state. Again, pressure flow is uh, also in studies right now. Hopefully, it should be approved next year, we're hoping. Uh, and it has a different material called the SIBS material, which is a very biocompatible material. I've uh, been used in, in, in military in terms of uh, its research. Been really a, a amazing technology. And what it, it, because it's so inert, we think it has less chance of scarring. Because with the Zen or any of these surgeries, what we do worry about is the tissue scarring down around those stents, where the fluid flows, but then this, the tissue of the country time collapses and scars around it and it causes the pressure to go up and we have to loosen up scar tissue but with the sibs the theoretical advantage is that it has less chance of scarring and it has hopefully will help keep those pressures maintained that should be approved hopefully next year Another exciting uh, stent or shunt is something called a beacon shunt, which is, again, under investigation now, which is going to help drain the fluid into the tear film. So it goes right where the brown part meets the white part of the eye, call this, right, this, the, the, the limbus. You put this in the eye, in the front of the eye, it drains right outside the eye into the tear film. But the one-way valve prevents bacteria from going in the eye. So it has a, the efficiency and quickness of the procedure is very attractive, bringing the pressure down nice and low. But of course, more studies are needed to, to validate the safety and continued efficacy and prevent it from you know, hopefully not collapsing or closing up. But again, something that's exciting that will give us an opportunity to help bring those pressures down for patients who may not have healthy conjunctiva because it is done at the limbus where you don't need healthy tissues. So how do we decide as surgeons? I mean, this is a lot of information that I've told you guys here. Well, it depends on so many different factors. The surgeon comfort level, how bad is the disease? If you want to do a, a mesh work where you just want to bypass the, the drainage system there, okay, if your patient is mild to moderate, disease, not very advanced, pressure targets, maybe the middle to upper teens, perfect surgery. If you need pressure down a 10, 11, 12 range and you're on four medications, a bypass surgery might be a better option. And also the, the course, the post-operative course, the more risky it is, the more we're going to wait for people to have more advanced disease. So again, these are all the things that we think about as well as indications. Again, those stents, the hydrus and eye stent are only approved at the time of cataract surgery, where those other surgeries we talked about where we can open up the drain, et cetera, those procedures are done as a standalone. You can do it if you have a cataract surgery already, or if you don't have a cataract, it can be done any time as well.
And last, I, want, I just want to talk to you about uh, traditional glaucoma surgery. For those of you who, let's say, still need pressure down at 10, 11, or even lower sometimes, and maybe had a previous MIGS procedure, we still have the ability to perform a trabeculectomy, which is a procedure where we make a flap and let the fluid leave the eye and basically close it back up again. And just, just showing you a, a video here, just showing you a, a of a trabeculectomy here. And it's just make, we're making a little opening, a little flap here and tying it down again. The idea is to make a trap door, a little hole in the eye and put it back again. So this is a, a version of a subconjunctival bypass surgery, but this is a, a more traditional version of it. A little more risk, but it does work well. And we can get the pressure down into the single digits with this kind of procedure as well. So I tell people we still need these kind of surgeries, even though they're not as elegant as some of those MIGS procedures, we still need them. And there are people who need tube surgeries. These are surgeries where, let's say you don't have a healthy conjunctiva to cover the white part of the eye for those other surgeries we talked about. We can have a tube that goes in the eye and a plate that sits out here that allows us to the fluid to leave the eye better. And so these, these work well when you don't have as, as healthy conjunctiva or if people, let's say, have other risk factors for trabeculectomy. A tube surgery is always an option there. So, you know, we love to do these other MIGS procedures and lasers and drug delivery, but sometimes people need these traditional glaucoma surgeries. And this is showing you a tube here that I'm in one of my cases here where we're going to put the tube in the eye and drain to a plate outside the eye as well. Now, lastly, uh, I want to talk to you about something that's really cool <laughs> and really exciting that I, I'm excited about uh, by a company called Equinox. And these are pressurized goggles that actually decrease some of the pressure around the eye. So if you think about what we, what we do in our, in our daily life, we actually are pressurized. So we have pressure from gravity, et cetera, pushing around us. And what these goggles do is they, de they actually have a vacuum pressure. You have a goggles that per vacuum. By having a vacuum, it's taking away the, the pressure that's constantly on our eyes that can actually de decrease the pressure inside the eye and actually help the blood flow. And so this is actually pretty neat. And the technology is really called, it's a multi-pressurized dial. We can actually dial in how low we want the pressure to be. And it's been verified with studies that actually can lower the pressure. And especially for people who have blood flow issues, what we call normal tension glaucoma, where the pressure is never very high to begin with, we have a chance of actually bringing those pressures down. And especially at nighttime, where we think the blood pressure goes down, the eye pressure goes up, that can change the blood flow in the eye. We think this might help the blood flow, which may be a risk factor in some people who have what we call normal pressure glaucoma. And this is just a nice little slide showing us with the goggles in the and the control, which is uh, having no pressure in the eye, uh, pressurized goggles, uh, you can see how we're able to bring the pressure down as you, as you dial it in, you can see how we're able to get the pressure down lower and lower and lower. So this is something that's not quite yet there, but I think the next few years you, you might see this out in the marketplace and it might be a great benefit for those people who are progressing still, may have blood flow issues or even have normal pressure to begin with and maybe still progressing. This might be a good option. And then again, lastly, I think where we're headed also is our ability as as providers to understand what's happening to the pressure 24 hours a day. I mean, we're seeing you only one minute out of a 24 hour period, right? What's happening at two in the morning? What's happening in the evening time? What's happening in the morning before you, before you come in, before you take your medications? And so now there's different devices on the marketplace that are looking at long-term long -term pressure uh, uh, monitoring. Here's one of, the, one of the different systems here that allows us to actually implant this little system. It takes a few minutes in the office, a painless procedure that allows us then to have a mobile sensor. And so we can have a patient home, especially with, let's say with now with COVID, we want to be able to do, let's say, a telemedicine visit. We can actually have you understand your pressures from home and we can get a better understanding of, hey, are you okay to wait around? Or, you can, or yeah, can you have to come back in in a few more months or can you wait six months, let's say. So being able to access that data uh, from you without you having to come in the office and checking your pressure, I think is exciting. So using the cloud, using, using technology to help us understand how well are your pressures controlled and I think that's going to give us a better understanding as well. So with that said, I think the future is exciting for all of us. Glaucoma is a tough disease. I uh, wish you all well, those of you who are suffering from glaucoma. Just know that we're, we're thinking about better and better and better ways to help take care of you. I think combining surgeries, better diagnostics, understanding when do we, how early do we have to intervene, I think, and other non-pressure related ways to, bring the, uh, to help uh, prevent glaucoma damage. I think the future is bright and hang in there. And again, thank you for the opportunity. Sorry if I babble too much and talk too fast, but uh, I love this stuff too much and I love being here. So thank you again. Talk to you soon. Thank you, Paul. That was informative and entertaining. Once again, we would like to thank our presenting sponsor, Allergan. 
for their constant support of glaucoma patients.